Well, there you are, and here I am. It's Wednesday afternoon, April 1st, in the pastor's office. Thanks for joining me for a few minutes. As we look at God's Word, as we before we close in prayer at the end of the session, I have a question for you today regarding human authority. Today, in our situation, are Christians being asked to violate their biblical principles by staying home, by not going to church, by not meeting together as the body of Christ is used to doing? Are we actually being asked to violate Christ's commands to us? And how should we respond to human authority who asks us to do such things? Perhaps you, like I, have been prompted to ask this question because I've been reading about examples happening across our nation of pastors being reprimanded, even being arrested, groups being disbanded, churches uh, meeting together in spite of executive orders and government edicts to refrain from meeting together, uh, universities. Christian universities being reopened. I'm not going to name any specific examples, but I've seen several, so have you. And they're all doing so in the name of honoring God and maintaining their rights and liberties. And they're going to keep doing what they're doing, and the government is infringing upon their rights. Is it? Really? I know that such things do indeed happen, and I'll be the first one to tell you I am against it. Here I am with my patriotic coffee cup today. Coffee or die. The old 13 colonies symbol of liberties to not be infringed upon by human governments. But before I answer that question, I'd like you to consider with me a story. Two stories, actually, found in the book of Daniel. Daniel has at least these two examples, if not more, of real cases where believers were asked to violate their convictions by human authority. The first one's in Daniel chapter 3. It happened to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You're familiar with the story. King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon made a 90-foot tall golden idol statue, and he set it up on the plain of Shinar, and he called all the officials and magistrates all together in huge audience and said, when you hear the music playing, when the band starts, I want you all fall down on your face to the ground and worship this idol. Of course, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego being sound followers of the one true God. When the mass of people all bowed down, there were three little heads sticking up above the crowd. They didn't bow. They would not fall down and worship. Nebuchadnezzar called them to him and said, What's this? Is it true what I see and what I hear that you have not bowed down and obeyed the command I gave you? Now, if you do it, I'm going to give you a second chance. When you hear the music play... Bow down and worship. If you don't, I will throw you into the fiery furnace, and you will be consumed by the flames. Go. And the three young men said, O oh, king, we don't need to go. We already know our answer. No matter what happens, we will not bow down to the idol that you have made. We trust in our true God to deliver us should he choose. There is nothing you could do against us. However, if God does not choose to deliver us from the fiery furnace... Know that no matter what, we will not bow down and worship in a way contrary to what pleases our Lord. And of course, so they were thrown in the fire furnace. And Christ miraculously intervened and delivered them. And Nebuchadnezzar wrote a new edict and said, This God, this God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is the true God. Three chapters later, we find a new king, a new empire, but Daniel is still around. He has survived the changes in time. Now he's before King Darius and the other officials, the other rulers, the other advisors to King Darius really, really hate Daniel because he's favored, because he's so wise, because he's so respected. God's blessing is on him. He's a godly man and so therefore he is opposed by the forces of the world. And so they look to try to find a way to attack him. And they know they can't find a single fault in his character. He is the model citizen. He is an upright man. He is a good servant. They can't find anything wrong with him. So the only way they can trip him is to somehow capture him in his faith. So they trick King Darius into making an edict that cannot be reversed, which is, O king, may no one for a period of 30 days pray to any god but you. 
Make that a law, King Darius. And for some reason, King Darius thought that sounded like a great idea. So he put into writing, he made it into law and the books of the Medes and Persians. No one could pray to any god, any other entity but him for the period of a month. Daniel got the command. He went up into his house, scripture says, closed the door, opened the front windows of his house as he did every day, three times a day, and he prayed facing Jerusalem. And scripture says he specifically asked God for help. Well, these doings were reported to the officials. It was brought before the king. Daniel has violated the command. It cannot be reversed. It can't be undone. He must be punished. So what happened to Daniel? He was thrown in the den of lions. And God miraculously delivered him. And King Darius ordered a new edict and said, The God of Daniel is the one true God. And those who tried to destroy him, may they be thrown with their families and all their possessions into the den of lions. So God miraculously delivered his servants in each case when they refused to violate the true convictions and commands of God. When the command was clearly given, you shall worship no other gods besides me. No graven image. So it's a matter of worship. It's a matter of bowing down. Who will we put above all others? See, and today our we're not being asked to worship a false god. We're being asked to be inconvenienced for the sake of everyone else. But we're not being asked to pray to a different god or to love someone else, something else other than Jesus. We have the full practice and expression of our personal faith in Jesus, the opportunity to pray, to serve our families, to be a good testimony, all we want. We've been inconvenienced. Yes, I know that. But in fact, for the most part, I actually see people being encouraged to pray. People being encouraged uh, to look up, to be positive, to be hopeful, to be expressive in their faith. I got an email just this morning from Facebook. I would never say that Facebook has been a, uh, a Christianity encouraging entity. But they contacted me today and says a member of the as a member of the faith community as a leader of churches in your community trying to connect with your people please let us know that we're here to support you in that how can we help you reach people better how can we help you stay together and do your job as a pastor i was impressed so in fact we're trying people are trying to help and encourage us to be creative in these days now of course there are always those who overstep their authority. As individuals, there are those who might particularly have an agenda. For example, I understand that there is a Minnesota helpline or hotline you can call to report your friends and neighbors if you see somebody violating the executive order. Oh, they're not staying at home. Oh, they're getting too close together. Would I do that? Would I call up my neighbor, about my neighbor, and say, hey, they were four feet, or husband and wife, we're holding hands in the park, walking together. Yes, that was called in. Um, people seen outside their homes, for example, that were known to have coronavirus, but they were cleared, they were recovered by their doctors. They were allowed to go back out and get groceries, do whatever. They were called and reported in because people didn't know that they'd been cleared. Things like that. I do believe that is a violation of privacy, a violation of rights. I would not participate in that. But these pastors being reprimanded uh, for holding services of hundreds, thousands, these mega churches and such, insisting we're going to continue meeting together no matter what, nobody's going to stop us. I don't know if that's really loving your neighbor as yourself. I don't really know if that's the most glorifying thing for Jesus that we can do. I think that's stupid. I think that's a bad testimony. I think this university president who has decided to open his campus and bring a thousand students back on campus when this crisis has reached a peak, I think that's stupid. So may we as believers differentiate between our rights and convictions truly being violated and us being stubborn and prideful and stiff in our ways. There is a fine line there and we should be vigilant about it and observant about it. But 
the Lord tells us, Romans chapter 13 is a good example. Peter also writes about being under authority. The authorities that be are set up by God to be his instruments and accomplish his will. And we can honor those authorities. As long as those authorities are not commanding us, not asking us to directly violate a clear command of Scripture, Scripture, the Lord Jesus, the Holy Spirit, that is our ultimate authority. Do you think the Roman Caesars, the Roman governors, the magistrates, and the apostles of day were in any way sympathetic to the Christian, to the Christian plight? I doubt it. These guys are bad. Bad. We don't have to deal with that. One of my most memorable experiences in college was going to Rome, touring the Roman Forum, seeing the Mamertine prison there under the floor of the Roman Forum, going and descending down the steps underground to tour the Roman catacombs. The catacombs were where the Romans buried their dead. There were shelves, bones, people laid to rest. And that is where the early Christian church for quite some time were forced to meet in secrecy because church meetings were seriously banned. The worship of Christ, the dead king of the Jews, was strictly forbidden. And all kinds of weird reports, as you can imagine, would seep out from the secret meetings. There's a religious sect that meets among the tombs and they have these feasts of eating the flesh and drinking the blood of their risen savior okay things were always drawn out of proportion but i remember walking down in there and, and thinking about these were brothers and sisters in christ who met here in secret and i could see their paintings on the walls and the hand and the writing left inscribed in messages for those to follow and i thought wow this is incredible Believers all over the world, throughout all time, have suffered and sacrificed and been inconvenienced to love Jesus. That time may come. There have certainly been violations even in our own nation in recent years. But today, in light of this current isolation period, that's, that's not what's happening here. May you and I, as we've been challenged in Scripture to do, be model citizens, to be the most considerate, upright, conscientious, encouraging, positive people that we can be and love and serve. I think in days to come that will promote our cause so much more. In closing today, let's take a couple moments to pray for those in authority because I think we get so caught up in human dependence, on human perspective, on human might and solutions for our problems, and we forget that it's always been God that we depended on for everything, not people, and that they, they're all instruments in his hand, part of his divine plan. So in closing today, let's pray. Thank you for your time. Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you for preserving your people through all ages thank you for honoring your name at all times good and bad through the history of the world thank you for giving us these living examples in scripture people like daniel shadrach meshach and abednego who refused to bow the knee to anyone but their lord and they were willing to pay the ultimate sacrifice not compromise what you had already commanded them to do May we follow their example. Give us wisdom, Lord, to know the difference when we are being asked to inconvenience ourselves and when we are actually being asked to disobey you. Typically, the contrast is pretty clear. May we know the difference, Lord, between being obedient and faithful to you and when we're just being stubborn, prideful, unwilling to be inconvenienced. Forgive us for our bad attitude toward human authority because we know they're faulty, we know they're frail. Our, our hope is not in them. Our trust is not in them. But today, Lord, we do pray for the success of our nation. We pray for the success 
and the endeavors of its leadership. We pray for our president and his cabinet, his advisors, the special panels created to deal with this crisis. Give them insight, give them wisdom, give them integrity and urgency and great success in their efforts to serve others and help. We pray, Lord, for the doctors and the nurses, the health teams, the EMTs, the police officers, those in essential lines of duty that face danger every day. We pray for them earnestly. And we pray that people would respond to the cautions, the edicts, the orders, the recommendations of those in authority, that they would not endanger all of us by their foolishness, by their pride, by their disregard for authority. It is not American, it is not Christian to disregard authority. It is foolish, it is displeasing to you. So I pray, Lord, that that would end. And Lord, that you'd be honored and glorified by our obedience and our trust in you. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will trust in the name of the Lord our God. So we pray for our leaders, as elected and appointed by you, not just by us, as ordained by you for their success. We pray for the citizens of this country. We pray for their character at this time, that they'd be hopeful, not discouraged that they'd take precautions, that they'd be responsible and not throw caution to the wind, that they'd consider one another, that they'd love their neighbor as they love themselves. We pray for our children and grandchildren at this time, that you bless and protect them, that they would follow you, that you would be growing in their life. And this would be a great time of testing and transformation and revival in them. Lord, we pray for the churches, that we would not grow weary in well-doing, that we would not become disconnected or disheartened, but that we would be faithful, that we'd be feeding on your word, that we'd be seeking out one another, that we'd be calling one another, encouraging one another, serving one another, no matter where we are, and that this time would actually strengthen us and cause your church to grow, that you'd add daily to our number such as you would, as would be saved that this would be a cry of salvation from those who have never even considered your name or their need for you before. You can do this. We commit it all to your wonderful hands. Increase our faith. Increase our joy. Lift our eyes to heaven for whence comes our help. Our help comes from the Lord, the one who made heaven and earth and controls it all. And we will commit to constantly praying for these things and for your glory. May you find us so doing when you come. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you for spending these few minutes with me. Hope that you could gain something today for this discussion on human authority and the Christian response. Be blessed. Be encouraged. I love you. I'm praying for you. I'll be in touch with you again sometime soon. Take care.